Hi, I'm Old Norse Specialist Dr. Jackson Crawford. Today on my channel about Norse language and myth, I want to tell you about the poem Hovamal. Now, in the past 20-something years, everything Viking has become incredibly popular. And so people have heard about this poem, although their awareness of its actual contents tends not to be very high. Sometimes people have heard Sansa 77, cows die, family die, etc. And sometimes people have heard that it contains magic spells and so imagined it's kind of a spell book, which it isn't. What it is, is a fascinating example of universally applicable worldly wisdom delivered in the person of the Viking's chief god, Odin. Let's take a closer look at it. Now, the way I'm pronouncing the name of this poem, Hovamal, is the reconstructed Old Norse pronunciation from about the time the poem was written down in the 1200s. You're more likely to have heard it pronounced as Hauvamal, which is perfectly legitimate as the modern Icelandic pronunciation, but I prefer to use the pronunciation that's consonant with the text as it was actually written. Now, it was written in a manuscript called the Codex Regius, together with the other poems of the Poetic Edda. That manuscript dates from about 1270, although it's copied from an earlier manuscript that probably was written down about 1200, although that one is lost. Linguistic evidence, however, tells us that this poem probably originally dates from the 900s, although it's probably not originally one single composition. Uh, I'll talk about that a little bit more in just a minute. Now, the meaning of the title is pretty clear. Mole means words, speech, counsel, something along those lines in Old Norse. And hova means of the high one. Now, Odin is the high one. You can also, using a more obscure vocabulary item, read it as words of the one-eyed one. In that case, it still refers to Odin, and potentially the double potential meaning is deliberate, although the one-eyed word uh, would have already been very obscure by the time the poem was written down. Now, the Codex Regius, and thus the text of Halvamal and the other Eddic poems, is not actually written down in runes. That's another common misconception. Instead, it's written in the alphabet we use today, although with the addition of some letters for writing sounds that the Roman alphabet wasn't originally uh, meant to uh, convey. I'll show you a picture from the uh, Adne Magnuson Institute of the uh, manuscript with a page of Halvamal right there, and there I'll zoom in so you can see uh, this is the same alphabet, right? You can recognize many letters there, G's, U's, etc. It can take a little bit of specialized instruction or practice to learn how to read it very fluently, um, but it's actually uh, a, a very clear hand of the Roman alphabet. Now, the text often talks about runes. Uh, that is absolutely true, but it is not in runes. One interesting thing, though, is that one rune is used to stand for uh, a word. So in the younger Futhark runes, which were the runes actually used to write Old Norse, the elder Futhark, which is better known, was used uh, many centuries before Old Norse and went out of use before this stage of the language was reached. Uh, in the younger Futhark runic alphabet, there is a rune for the letter or sound M, which is named Madr. Now, madr means man or person, a word that's one of the most common in the language, naturally. To save space, the scribe in the manuscript actually writes that word with that rune. And so in my own edition of the poem Havmal, in the Old Norse text, in the book called The Wanderer's Havmal, you'll find that in the Old Norse text, I have reproduced uh, that rune with the Greek letter Psi, which looks almost identical to the way the rune is written in the manuscript. I'll show you uh, the manuscript and uh, in my book there, so you can compare. Now, this book, The Wanderer's Havmal, includes the text of Havmal sourced directly from the manuscript without any sort of intermediary, uh, I choose to present what's actually there and not to imagine or speculate uh, what ought to be there. <laughs> and I also present a facing page English uh, translation, which is what I'll be reading a few quotes from uh, as we go forward in this, this video. Now, I mentioned that Hovmal probably originally is not one single composition. That's because the language is subtly different from place to place. Um, even the dating of the language we would think is a little bit different from place to place. And there's some broad chunks of text that probably originally stood alone. Now, they might all have originally been attributed to Odin, 
but they probably weren't all gathered into one place in one poem uh, until later, perhaps in the original manuscript, um, the lost manuscript from about 1200. Now, we typically call these uh, sub-poems or sections uh, by five different names. The first one is Gesta Thotr, that is the part of guests or for guests. This is the part of Havamal people mostly think about when they think about Havamal. And although the boundaries between different sections are a little bit unclear, typically we say this is from about stanza 1 to about 79 because the meter is very consistent except for one stanza 73 um, for those stanzas. A Gesta Thotr I would sum up as being a poem about using your head and not getting stuck in your head. It's about practical wisdom. It's about this life, right? There's nothing about the afterlife. There's nothing about the supernatural. There's really nothing about magic in these stanzas. It's about wise living, and it's as applicable in any continent or any century as it was in uh, the 900s in Norway when it was probably originally composed. That's followed by a section called Dömi Odens, or reverse the word order, Odens Dömi, either way. Uh, and these are just modern names, by the way, for these sections. That means Odin's examples, uh, although in English it's often called Odin's love advice, and that's exactly what it is. Odin tells us about the love of the two sexes for one another, the reasons the two sexes ought not to trust one another, and, for good measure, some other things that people ought not to trust. He also tells two stories of trying to seduce women. One time he fails, and another time he succeeds. And in the process of succeeding, he wins the mead called Odreir, which makes its drinker a poet. That section, which we can roughly say goes from about 84 to 110, I'm leaving out the stanzas around 80, which are probably kind of a uh, miscellaneous grab bag thrown in later. After Demi Odens, we have the section called Lodfopnes Mall, which is stanzas 111 to 137. Here, Odin is speaking to someone named Lodfopnir, hence the name Lodfopnes Mall, words of or for Lodfopnir, and giving him advice. Some of this advice is a lot like the advice in Gestathotr, very worldly, characterized by a certain amount of suspicion, um, uh, and emphasis on moderation and uh, understanding of one's fellow man. But it also has a few things that are a little bit more mystical. Uh, you get warnings about witches uh, and a little bit about some vague magical remedies at the very end in stanza 137. That section is followed by the runatal, that is, tally of runes. That stanzas 138 to 145. This section begins with the very famous stanzas 138 to 139, where Odin explains that he hung for nine long nights, sacrificed himself to himself on a tree whose roots no one has ever seen. Pierced by a spear, which is probably his own spear, Gungnir, that tree is probably Yggdrasil, the tree which has roots in the various different worlds. While the story is only told here, we infer from the somewhat cryptic text that he sacrificed himself to himself in order somehow to learn the runes. The following stanzas then tell us a little bit about the powers of runes without necessarily teaching them to us. That is followed by the last section, 146 to 164. That is the section called Lyodatal, Tally of Spells. Here, Odin tells us about 18 magic spells he knows. Nine and multiples of nine are important numbers in Norse myth. But he does not tell us how to cast them. So he shows off what he knows how to do, but without actually explaining how we can gain said power ourselves. And the poem closes in 164 by wishing well to the speaker and listener of it. So what are some of the themes in the wisdom of Havamal, especially Gesta Thotr? Watchfulness and suspicion are a major theme, and we see that already in stanza one. Let me read this to you in Old Norse to give you some flavor, and then I'll read you my English translation. Gottir allar oder gangi fram um skoda skili um skygna skili 
Því að óvíst er að vita var óvinnir sitja og fletti fyrir. At every doorway, before you enter, you should look around. You should take a good look around, for you never know where your enemies might be seated within. Odin emphasizes that all of us being out for ourselves, out to survive, may at times be treacherous with others. We thus need to value our friends and not betray them. Friendship and the mutuality of friendship is a major theme, especially in the middle part of Gesta Thotr. We are warned to be humble about our intelligence, but to try to know as much as we can. We are advised to travel, meet other people, get to know other people and other ways of being a man. We are advised to stay sober, something that sometimes surprises people in a text coming from the famously drunk Viking society. We are advised to be hospitable with travelers, a major value of Norse society that we see throughout, uh, throughout the sagas where even enemies may be given hospitality. And we are advised to remember that we are mortal and we will die. As the famous stanza 77 has it, Dörfe, döja frander, dör sjálfrit sama. Ek veit ein at aldri dör, domr um dauðan hvern. Cows die, family die, you will die the same way. I know only one thing that never dies, the reputation of the one who dies. Even more haunting on that note uh, than that better known stanza is this one that few people seem to know, stanza 71. Halter, rýðr, hrósi, hjörð, rekkar handarvannr, dauvr, vegar og dugir, blindar er betri, en brendr se, nyter mangi nós. A limping man can ride a horse, a handless man can herd, a deaf man can fight and win. It's better even to be blind than fuel for the funeral pyre. What can a dead man do? Well, a dead man certainly can't love, which Odin will talk about in the section called Dumi Odin. So let me give you uh, some characteristic quotes here. Here's one that people tend to impugn these days, although it has a counterpart uh, intended for women. This is stanza 84. Möjar orðu skildi mangi trúa ne því er kveðar kona. Því at o hverfanda hvelli voru þeim hjörtu skopuð, brygð í brjóst um lagið. No man should trust the words of a girl, nor anything a woman says. Women's hearts are molded on a wobbly wheel. Faithlessness is planted at their core. And before you think this is all just picking on women, here's the corresponding stanza. 91. Bert ek nu mali, thviat ek bæði veit, brigdar er kalla hugar konum. Þó ver fegrst malum, er ver flost hyggjum, þa tælir horska hugi. I'll speak plainly now because I know both men and women. Men lie to women. We speak most eloquently when we tell the biggest lies and seduce even wise women with lies. Of course, as I mentioned, Odin will then go on to talk about how he failed to seduce the daughter of Billing, whoever she and Billing are, and how he successfully seduced Gunnlöð. Apparently, uh, although the story is not told in detail here, apparently seeming to marry her uh, and make away with the Mead Othorir uh, sometime after the vows are exchanged. This is a different story of the acquisition of the poetry, the, uh, the drink, the Mead of Poetry, then you'll find in Snorri Sturluson's better-known prose edda, where uh, there's no, uh, no apparent wedding. Then in Lord Fulton Small, as I said, we get some more advice. I'll give you a little bit of uh, the character here. One of my very favorites is stanza 133. Oft vitu ogorla, fer er sitja inni hyrir. Hvers þeirru kynns er koma. Er at maður svo góður at galli ne fylgi, ne svo illar at einugi dugi. 
Those inside the house rarely know anything about the stranger who knocks at their door. But there is no man so good that he has no flaw, nor a man so bad he's good for nothing. Good words to remember, as most of all them all is. Now, Runatal, as I said, starts with these mysterious stances about Odin's sacrifice of himself to himself. I have a whole video about this, but I'll give you, um, give you the flavor here by reading these to you. 138 to 139. <speaking in Spanish> O the meithi er man gyveit, hwars han av rotum ren. Vith leivi mik syldu, ne vith hornigi. Nysta ek nidr, nam ek up runar, upan dinam, fel ek after thadan. I know that I hung on a wind-battered tree, nine long nights pierced by a spear, and given to Odin, myself to myself, on that tree, whose roots grow in a place no one has ever seen. No one gave me food, no one gave me drink. At the end I peered down, I took the runes, screaming, I took them, and then I fell. And in the final section, Leo the Tall, we get the, uh, <laughs> we get to hear about all the spells Odin knows without telling us how to cast them. Here's an example, Sansa 156, his 11th spell. That can ek it elifta, ev ek skaldil orustu leitha langvini. Undirandir ek gel en ter med riki fara, heilir hildar til, heilir hildi fro, koma ther heilir hwadan. I know an eleventh spell, if I lead old friends into a battle. I enchant their shields so that they will have the victory. They will go to battle unharmed and return from battle unharmed. They will come home without harm. A uh, spell that's become famous in recent years on the internet. It's always hard for me to trace exactly where these things get famous. Notice in the text that I've given you here, which again is coming from my book, The Wanderers Hall of Them All, derived directly from the Codex Regius, that there are some spellings that are a little bit different, by the way, from the spellings on sometimes even the word choices that you'll see uh, when this text is reproduced online. That's because often what you're seeing online is moved one of two directions. It's modernized to look more like modern Icelandic, or it's archaized to look more like really early Viking Age Old Norse on the notion that this is what the original language would have looked like. Whereas I present it to you in the language that it's actually preserved in because I don't feel entitled to speculate about uh, what it ought to look like earlier. or uh, And I don't see any need to modernize it because modern is an ever-shifting goalpost. Now, in translation, of course, I try to present very modern English because I am trying to reach people alive at the same time as I am. It's a little bit different. And I will close with the same words Halvamal closes with. Stanza 164, good wishes for the speaker and the hearer. Nu eru hovamol kveden, hova hollu i. Al thorv utasonum, o thorv jotnasonum. Hail so er quad, hail so er can, nyoti so er nam, hailir ters hlutu. Now the words of the one eyed are heard in Odin's hall, for the benefit of humans, for the harm of giants. Health to you who speak them, health to you who know them, profit to you who learn them, health to you who hear them. Now, for the complete Old Norse text derived directly from the Codex Regius, and a facing page English translation, a lot of commentary, and an informative introduction. I hope you'll check out The Wanderers Hall of Mall. If you want to read it in Old Norse yourself and perhaps see what these stanzas might have looked like in runes because so many people requested this that I did it, thinking it would draw people to Patreon, um, you can check out my uh, videos in a playlist called The Poetic Edda in Old Norse where I've read through the entire Hall of Mall in Old Norse and given you the text as it would have appeared I think, in Viking Age Younger Futhark runes. Well, for now, hoping that has been informative or interesting for you. And standing here in the middle, the most beautiful place in the world, the Never Summer Mountains of Northern Colorado, I'm wishing you all the best. The whole point of this video channel, the whole point of my books, is to bring 
good information about these subjects to the people who want it in the places where they're looking for it online. Otherwise, the people who know what they're talking about are all trying to impress each other, talking to each other in the ivory tower, and they're never reaching out to the public. The people who are reaching out to the public on YouTube or wherever else mostly are scared, angry people trying to, to, to spread centuries-old cartoonish uh, racialist theories and, and crazy mysticism that has nothing to do with our medieval sources. I want to bring good information about our real medieval sources straight to you in the places where you're looking for it without an agenda, without trying to set myself up as some ivory tower super genius who's better than you. You can help me do that by donating small monthly amounts on my Patreon. And everyone who does that has my everlasting thanks for your incredible generosity and the way that you help me make a university of uh, my favorite place in the world, the Great Rocky Mountain Outdoors. Well, from now, from the middle of beautiful Colorado, let me wish you good thinking, good skepticism, and all the very best. <laughs>